Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next session on the Business of Semiconductor Summit 2024. Our next presenter is Dr. Brian Riemann. Um, before we launch, I'd like to tell you that this session is sponsored by Synaptics. Synaptics is changing the way humans engage with connected devices and data, engineering exceptional experiences throughout the home, at work, in the car, and on the go. Use Synaptics, Extra AI native multimodal compute platform for the IoT to quickly design optimized edge devices that will allow generative AI models to operate locally, enabling immediate, immersive, and personalized experiences. A few tips before we begin. If you have a question for Dr. Rima anytime during this during his presentation, please click the QA tab in the upper right corner of your screen and type your question into the window. We will try as much as possible to answer all of the questions that you pose. And if you have any technical difficulties, no problem, just click the chat button and uh, we have administrative support assistance waiting to assist. All our presentations are being recorded and they will be available after the live session. So. Welcome to Thinking Beyond LLMs, Exploring the Value and Impact of Human-Centered AI. This is being presented by Dr. Brian Rima. He's a research scientist at MIT's Age Lab. Dr. Rima collaborates with industries worldwide on the topics of driver safety, vehicle automation, and other technological concerns related to human factors and artificial intelligence. In 2000, this year, Dr. Rima was appointed to the Department of Transportation's Transforming Transportation Advisory Committee, a 27-member team of experts and advocates that's providing advice on plans and approaches for transportation innovation. This particular presentation will highlight the need for AI systems that enhance human capabilities in product development rather than replace human intelligence. Dr. Rima, it's always a pleasure to have you. You have the floor. Oh, thank you very much for having me here today. Very much excited to, to share um, a little viewpoint. Um, let me share my screen here quickly in, in theory. Um, you will all see some slides on my screen, except I can't do anything because it's blocked. Um, so as Bola introduced, um, the talk today is Thinking Beyond LOMs, Exploring the Value and Impact of Human-Centered AI. And I'll, I'll start here today with, with challenging the audience um, to think for a second. What is artificial intelligence? AI. We hear about it every day. We read about it in the news. What is that to you? To me, the best definition that I can find by David Peterson, AI reflects, it refers to the simul simulation of human intelligence by machines. It has an ever changing definition as new technologies are created to simulate humans better and the capabilities and limitations of AI are revisited. I think David captures the essence here incredibly well, ever changing. So whatever our definition of AI is today, it's likely to be different tomorrow. So the elephant in the room, as you might say, is that as we try to define what AI is, it's changing under our feet. Who would have thought nearly two years ago that the transformation of what large language models have provided us would drive such innovations in AI? Deep learning machine learning years back. The question is, what's next? And if we think about that a little more, we begin to open some new questions. When we think about AI in particular and talk about the topic, AI just means different things to different people. And that's because we don't have a clear and consistent definition. Disagreements on the value of AI are not new. Conflicting opinions, on what it is and what its impacts have been discussed for decades. We think about researchers, we're also often thinking about theoretical advances 
you know, the computer science uh, literature advances very rapidly and better ways of separating cats and dogs, optimizing algorithms and the like. Developers trying to harness these theoretical advancers to advance usable functions, speech systems, chatbots, decision systems in, in some way. Politicians are involved considering the risk to society. As Bowl introduced, my efforts in, in the U.S. Department of Transportation's Transforming Technology Advisory Committee talking a lot about biosecurity, access, equity, and how those topics are impacted by the evolution of AI systems. Investors see the market potential, whether that's Tesla or some other AI company producing semiconductor chips, hardware, software, looking to profit from the characteristics and enhancements that AI has to offer. And at the end of the day, what do consumers want? Technology that can help improve our lives, increase comfort, convenience, safety, make my microwave look, work a little easier, make it a little easier to drive, or perhaps some days a Jetson-like robot beginning to relieve me of some of the household chores. Today, AI always seems to be a hot topic in the news. Just yesterday, Apple's release of the iPhone. You know, interestingly discussed this morning, the fact that the, the words artificial intelligence, while at the thread of some of the functionality, were not mentioned during the press event. Wall Street debating the value of AI in investments. How close large language models may be to reaching human intelligence. How much investment is going in different directions? Where do we need transformational changes in the compute capabilities? Or what perhaps are the environmental impacts of all of this? Topics that, that a quick search of the news will, will, will cite articles from the last day to week, let alone months. So as we continue to flood the market with new ideas and new potentials, the, the intersection between policy, business, and innovation is so hot here. AI, and in particular, the advance of large language models today are really the hottest technology on the planet. And when we think about that, we also can move back to thinking about you know, the Gardner hype cycle and the many thinking about where are we with AI on the, on the uh, path through the hype cycle. And the question is, which AI technology are we talking about? You know, there's a lot of AI-based technologies that have made it out to the plateau of predictivity, and there's others that are really caught in the trough of this illusion. So one great illustration here of a technology that I'd argue that is largely caught in the trough of disillusionment is the path to highly automated driving. Modern autonomous driving was predicated on rapid advancements in AI a decade ago. As I've written about several times over the last decade, the path to highly automated vehicles is really one that is perhaps long and winding and perhaps even more today, not defined by technology alone, but defined more on the investments required to keep some of the leading players here funded over what is likely to be several decades of investment needed until these technologies can provide the benefits that we would like. In essence, moving me around a city or, or, or a region of the US effectively at a price point that can truly compete with largely human-centered systems. When you think about the challenges around highly automated driving, the operational complexities that we're looking to solve are, are one of the first topics that come to mind. We're not trying to solve path planning and navigation uh, complexities in snowy, complex, foggy environments. No, we're looking to do that in easier, better weather conditions. Why? The limitations of sensing and compute are real. No matter how many sensors we want to put on a vehicle, you know, there are limitations both in cost and quality of the output data. Many of the players who have been involved in the automated driving race have overhyped and overly aggressive published growth plans. That's not to say that we don't see level four automated vehicles on the roads of, of California and Nevada today. We do, providing substantive trips to, to consumers in relatively geo-constrained environments. 
Perspectives on safety are still tried to, tied primarily to human drivers and often don't reflect the types of drivers that we're looking to replace. We're not looking to replace the average driver that, that pulls out of their driveway. We're looking to replace taxi and Uber drivers. And we need to do so at levels of reliability and safety that are perhaps magnitudes better than human capabilities. We often don't talk about the large and significant use of back-end human capital, elegantly highlighted in some of the mishaps crews had a year ago. Complexity is involved in building and maintaining trust of consumers. You know, consumers are looking for an experience and it is very difficult and a long process to create the trust in that experience, but often trust is eroded very quickly. So as I mentioned a moment ago, the challenging path from investment to a revenue producing business and the, and the enhancements in that business required are going to take time. So at current time, until we really begin to discuss how safe is safe enough and how convenient is convenient enough and how equitable is equitable enough, you know, we're going to continue to need to invest more and more in honing the capabilities of the systems we're developing. Costs will continue to rise. The runway of input and investment continuing to need to be developed, perhaps further than the technologies that are, that are enabling these vehicles themselves. AI experts and AI skeptics are beginning to talk about this more and more. I got rotten tomatoes thrown at me years ago when I was suggesting that the evolution towards highly automated mobility may be several decades, if not the best part of a century in the distance. You know, fully automated AVs may never be able to operate safety without human active attention. Or what Pete Bigelow sum, summarized um, this, earlier this year, yet despite what McKinsey and co estimates at 204 billion poured into the self-driving technology, today's road fatality numbers are nearly identical. And the promise of wide term spread autonomous vehicles that go anywhere public roads can take them remains elusive. But the best comment that I think that, that an AI uh, skeptic here might be quoted on is Rodney Brooks, former head of MIT's artificial and computer science department, as well as a founder of iRobot, um, uh, produced many robots that are, that are changing how we live. I spent my entire professional life developing robots and my companies have built more of them than anyone else, it's true. But I can assure you that as a driver in San Francisco during the day, I was getting pretty frustrated with driverless cruise and Waymo vehicles doing stupid things that I saw and experienced every day. The complexities of building trust in these environments are immense. And we are just at the foundations of beginning to address that. My colleague, Missy Cummings, who spent some time at NHTSA um, over the last few years, published a piece earlier this year, five conclusions from an automation expert fresh off a stint with the US Highway Safety Agency, linking AI and automated vehicle topics together. In the automation equation, human errors in operation get replaced by human errors in coding. In essence, as we build software, we are shifting where those errors occur. Hopefully over time, minimizing them, but we can't afford begin to forget that at the end of the day, there is human expertise throughout the system. Building software, building hardware, assembling that, and from a moment to moment basis, overseeing that. AI failure modes are hard to predict. In essence, we do really well most of the time, but we don't envision the range of possibilities that may actually cause computer systems to fail when humans are quite capable of still operating. In essence, AI, as good as it's getting, still works on problems that are more black and white, while humans have incredible flexibility in the gray. Probabilistic estimates do not approximate judgments under uncertainty. As much as we want to bring math to that gray morass, it is difficult to predict under uncertainties. A topic that 
Phil Koopman and I discussed yesterday in our session, maintaining AI is just as important as creating AI. The life cycle costs of these systems are immense. We are creating technologies that we expect to last decades. How many of the boardrooms throughout the Fortune 500 companies working in the AI space are thinking about how do they maintain the systems that they are developing? Whether that's hardware changes, software changes, or the changes in the operational environment that will occur over the lifespans of the technologies. Finally, AI system level implications just can't be ignored. And this carries over to some of the trust characteristics that I was talking about earlier. So the societal questions here are really giant mountains. They're not little molehills. A fear of the unknown is leading to many of us taking assumptions. Assumptions about how good these systems may be and assumptions about how failure may occur. This is leading to discussions and in, in increases in regulatory red tape. Seeing the highlight to the right here, the White House putting new guardrails on the government's use of AI earlier this year. Topics dominating public sector conversations include biases, security, replicability, data ownership and usage rights, questionable use of the technology, bad faith actors, workforce impacts, decision support versus decision replacement, life or death decisions. Where should AI help us and where do we need guardrails to ensure that it doesn't do things outside of the realm of expectations? Even Sam Altman's comments, Earlier this year, in January, AI should not make life or death decisions. That's an interesting question because at some point, there are areas where AI should make better life or death decisions than humans. Finding that, optimizing that, building for that, and innovating forward probably relies on more transparency than it does in deterministic decision making. Understanding the flexibility of the systems we're creating, where they have advantages, where they have limitations, and where can we begin to rely on them, critical to moving through and navigating around these giant mountains. More recently, a number of articles beginning the question, is AI the business opportunity? A wonderful piece in The Economist earlier this summer. What happened to the artificial intelligence revolution? A piece in CNN, has the AI bubble burst? Wall Street wonders if artificial intelligence will ever make money. Some pieces about AI replacing human expertise, airlines and fast food restaurants beginning to be held responsible in different ways for the bad advice of AI. AI is everywhere. But it's very clear, only a select few organizations are really beginning to reap the rewards of this. The success of AI is in part, perhaps more linked with its long-term value than the short-term value of transformational change. In essence, it's going to be an evolution to generate the economic and societal values that AI has to offer. We're not gonna solve business opportunities overnight to transform business models everywhere. There will be a select few winners. So while billions of dollars of investment have resulted in limited monetization and cost savings, they have to date created numerous unintended consequences. Balancing better the business opportunity with the risk of those unintended consequences is going to be a critical facet of harnessing the power of AI. Automation of traditional human tasks is real. There's many things that, that we do in the lab at MIT today through automation that once we would have had the code. But the trends do not suggest mass AI-based layoffs based upon the economic indicators. That suggests that we are using AI to advance things faster, but we are still relying significantly in a lot of areas on human expertise in the model. Now, that doesn't mean I don't believe that there are some mass changes in employment coming, but we need to think more about how they may integrate with decision support tools. Economic, 
economists and business leaders are really beginning to talk a little more about how collaboration with AI could improve efficiencies. But this hasn't really appeared in macroeconomic trends. And this is a topic that I'm gonna dive into a little more here today, collaborating with AI, as opposed to looking to the AI engines to quote unquote, replace us or completely augment human capabilities. How do we really re-envision the collaborative capabilities of AI? But first, I wanna go back to Rodney Brooks for a moment, because if we're gonna truly make money with AI systems, we need to think a little bit more about the foundations. Rodney proposed three laws of artificial intelligence that I think capture a lot. When an AI system performs a task, human observers immediately estimate its general competencies in areas that seem unrelated. Usually those estimates are widely overinflated. In essence, when we see an AI system doing something, we usually begin to imagine the range of possibilities. And our imagination of those possibilities is often wildly out of scope with the capabilities of a system being demonstrated or deployed. Most successful AI deployments have humans somewhere in the loop, perhaps even the person that they are helping. And the intelligence of the humans smooths the edges. One thing that we often forget about AI and, and drone warfare is a great example, is there is human capabilities and expertise throughout the battlefield supporting the robots. U.S. Defense Department has talked at times about the fact that, that drone warfare is more expensive than conventional warfare. The political cost of losing a pilot's life, though, balances those, those complexities out. Humans are a critical component of AI driven system. We don't build robots yet without some kind of red off button, whether that is on board to the robot or off board, most would argue that there should be both redundancies in place. Third, Rodney talks about the fact that without careful boxing in how AI systems are deployed, there will always be a long tail of special cases that take decades to discover and fix. This is the problem of brittleness. There are always expectations outside that of the developer's view that consumers or deployment begin to uncover. Whether that's cybersecurity concerns, whether that is usage of the AI in ways outside of the envisionment of the design side, or failures in the engineering of the systems themselves. These are all elements that often take years to discover. These elements are going to be critical in maintaining the AI driven systems for years, if not decades past their development. The cost of those maintenance, that maintenance astronomical compared to the original development cost in many mission critical applications. So building that on a little further, I would argue that we need to really be thinking about how do we balance the risks and rewards of various AI deployments. It's not so simple, just automate, just leverage AI. We need to be thinking much more cohesively about how do we balance the value proposition. There's lots of benefits here. We need to harness those benefits with understanding and transparency to the limitations. As just talked about a moment ago, those edge cases, yeah, they're going to become rarer. As we do a better job at engineering around the life cycles of, of AI-driven innovations, but they are always going to exist, creating brittleness. There will always be situations that as engineers, we found it too difficult to predict. AI and automation will indeed change the nature of work and have impacted the workforce in some ways. As I mentioned earlier, some of the work we do at MIT being enabled more efficiently by AI. If we embrace careful planning, we can help accelerate new opportunities. In essence, move our resources from pure manual tasks to other areas. These necessarily, this means it don't necessarily result in cost savings, but opportunities to advance faster. 
misuse and overuse of technology is always going to occur when we have a, a capability to imagine things beyond the designers or the developers' dreams. This very well in many domains may require guardrails. Automated driving is a great example of an area where I believe we need stronger guardrails ensuring that organizations developing systems are actually working as responsible actors. Liability will change over time to hold model developers and users responsible. That means the person behind the driver's seat off the vehicle is gonna have a responsibility as well as the software engineers building systems. The liability side will change over time. It's not gonna happen instantaneously, but we're gonna see software systems, much like disasters in space, taken apart to understand the foundations of what occurred. I think one thing that we do need to remember very cohesively, society is probably not ready for systems without human oversight. We'll get there, but it's going to take time. We find comfort in the fact that humans do have access to a red off button. So I'd argue to maximize the near interim impact of AI, we need to begin considering prioritizing AI systems that aim to support or augment human capabilities versus replace human intelligence. You know, this fallacy of, of, of general artificial intelligence, you know, we're never easily going to get there overnight. Perhaps someday in, in the later part of my life or my kids or my grandkids' lives, yes, we will be able to develop artificial systems as, as bright and intelligent as the human mind. But the, for the time being, how do we move from trying to replace human capabilities to augmenting or supporting human capabilities? So that means less new methods, more application of existing methods, less black box solutions, more open box solutions, less focus on optimized systems, more focus on robust systems, less focus on decision and mission replacement, more focus on decision and mission support, moving away from central server solutions, focused on distributed and edge computing, moving away from AGI, artificial general intelligence, to human-centered intelligence. Building skills, trust, and experience in AI-driven systems can smooth our evolution towards greater reliance on AI and robotics, but it's going to take an evolution a human-centered focus that mitigates fears of the unknown is critical. As rapid changes occur, fears are likely going to be augmented, reducing trust and increasing roadblocks that impede the societal benefits that AI has to provide and support. So in essence, we need to build the trust in this system, the trust that AI can help us make better decisions. So let's talk about some examples here. Human provide, humans provide opinions and, quite frankly, hallucinate. So why do we think AI should be any different to err as humans? And machines are just deviations of humans programmed by humans. Methods exist to manage these opinions. When we look back to the Olympics a couple months ago, with the gymnastics athletes competing want to look to one vote on performance? We look to multiple judges or multiple jury members to average out different votes. We all have different opinions. In sociological research, we've looked at intercoder reliability to try to judge more objective output from different people looking at information. We go to business meetings. We often try to build consensus to manage the differences in opinion. Why should AI be any different? What does that mean? Thinking more of AI as an opinion. Looking for an opinion from OpenAI and Google. In essence, ChatGTP versus Gemini. They each provide us an opinion. If we look at both those opinions and try to assess intercodal reliability between them, maybe we truly do have a better foundation for a strong opinion. Looking at the AI system versus human opinion, okay? Decision support, AI provides me great 
illustrations and editing capabilities. I love going to ChatGTP and saying, okay, here's a sentence. What do you think about the grammar? And it comes back with a great suggestion on a word change or two, augmenting my capabilities to write. Trust in these systems is really king. When we think about skill, the future may be of relatively novice doers. You know, today, occasionally, we still do write things, whether that's with a pen and paper or a typewriter. Tomorrow, we're going to be asking large language models and chatbots to generate a lot more for us. We see a little of that today. We're going to see even more down the road. Let's embrace that AI will erode what were once core human skills. No question about it. We're not going to use a pen and paper the same way. But what we can say is that we will begin to build new skills as a result. As I mentioned, embracing that. We can't avoid it. We need to think about ways in which we can leverage these changes as part of an evolutionary process. This doesn't mean we want to become over-reliant on the automation and AI. It means we need to learn how to live with it, embrace it, beginning to use it to support our capabilities. I can't wait, for instance, to the spell check and grammar check in a word processing system integrates the capabilities of ChatGTP for providing, as I mentioned earlier, word selection choices, grammar edits, and the like. Not looking for ChatGTP to generate text for me. Knowing that this occurs, though, perhaps when we think about the education system, the first you know, um, statement from a college professor needs to be, in my class, you are able to use technology such as ChatGTP for X, editing your essays, doing initial research, but not writing your reports. In other cases, maybe it's okay to take a seven or a 10 year old and say, hey, use ChatGPT to do research for you in different ways at different stages. So building trust in AI and the evolving systems around it really may be the key. And this is not done overnight. I believe strongly that transparency builds trust over time and the lack of transparency leads to a loss in trust. So we need to become more transparent of what AI is actually doing for us. What are the limitations of it and where should we begin to leverage it as part of our lives? First impressions matter just as you're meeting somebody, you want the AI systems to make a lasting impression. One of the ways that this can easily occur is under-promising and over-delivering. It enhances consumer satisfaction from cars to appliances and will apply to AI systems as well, helping to mitigate some of the imagination of, oh, what can this do for me, but enhancing the satisfaction of, look what it did. We talk about biases in a lot of political conversations now. They can't be eliminated. But they need to be acknowledged, tracked, and most importantly, mitigated over time. You know, it's quite frankly OK to develop a bias model if that's the intended application. If I'm building a storefront to, to, to build in, 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 in for children's clothing, for example, an AI model that is biased to predicting what children may like is exactly what we should be building. But we need to be honest. This system provides advice to buying kids' clothing. Network limitations or the pipeways to get information between two places will always exist. Edge learning and edge computing provides opportunities. We will be able to store more information than we are capable of moving for at least the foreseeable future, if not always. Sustainability, the environmental characteristics is an important component. I spent a lot of time early in my career looking at electronic wastes. Energy consumption with a lot of the AI driven innovations is a hot news topic today. We need to be accepting that there are sustainability questions that need to be asked here and answered. How much energy and environmental impact are we creating, ensuring that we are making good societal decisions over the long haul. The challenges as I see it is a new mindset. 
where we effectively match problems, tools, and solutions. It's not about creating just new tools because we can. It's about solving real world problems, actionable solutions, and matching tools of the appropriate complexity to do that. Fine tuning of LLMs, really a core topic today, not necessarily building bigger models. How do we balance those two things together? Because a lot of what we're looking to do only needs fine tuning. There are areas for innovation and areas where the public and private sector need to work together to look at what's optimal, sustainable, and efficiently harness the power of these changes. AI will solve many of the world's challenges, but the speed in which we achieve this is far more develop dependent on the softer elements, public policy, consumer interest, business models, than the innovations in algorithms that we invest so much in. In essence, we need to start talking a lot more about the soft elements as opposed to new chips and new techniques. The difficulty that we are going to continue to struggle with is finding the right balance between human and machine intelligence, societal benefits and self-interests. Where do we need to push the societal benefits of an AI solution versus the corporate or the individual benefits to build those broader stakeholder support needed to ensure that we're using the right tools for the right problems. So I'll give you a parting thought. Think about the future of advice for a minute. Whether you're thinking about medical advice in the doctor's office, a financial advisor, or, or legal advice. Given that a random advisor of any category is theoretically equally as likely to be above or below average, again, 50% of any, any doctors you have to you go to you know, 50% can be above average, 50% have to be below average. Same thing with a lawyer or financial advisor. When do we think about replacing or augmenting this professional advice with AI? Okay, AI is probably more likely to be better than 50% accurate today. Under what conditions are we best served to weigh the advances of AI? How might humans begin to trust the advice of AI over humans? You know, some big picture questions of how do we think about augmenting what we do with the power of AI? And I think many of us are, are ready to weigh the value of AI-driven advice into our decisions. The AI algorithm suggests that these types of stocks may be a good idea. But looking to our financial advisor to take that input together with his own expertise to augment and try to enhance the support they provide. The same thing very much could be true in the doctor's office or in the legal realm. So as we move forward, I argue and encourage those on, uh, online here today to think about how do we use AI not to replace us today, but to augment what we are capable of to improve efficiencies, decisions, and the support in which AI can help transition how we live, move, and what I am capable of doing on a daily basis. With that, time for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Rimmer. That that was excellent. Uh, I I think one one thing immediately that I took away from this, and I made a note. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, bring on board uh, my colleague Junko Yoshida, who was just wrapping up another. Uh, session when uh, Brian started his. Uh, before Junko jumps in, you know, Brian, one of the things that struck me immediately you started talking was that you talked about the fact that AI is backed by human intelligence and it, is, and it requires human intelligence to function and function well. I, I'd like you to kind of dive deeper into these because it, it seems to me that you, you I, I know you like to talk about safety and I think you kind of wrap it around the issue of safety and efficiency too. So Paul, look, when we build an AI system, humans select what data this should be trained on. Humans program these systems. They develop the algorithms, devise the algorithms. We, by those very choices, are shaping the nature of the AI-driven system. On the hardware side, semiconductors, our choice of semiconductors shape the capabilities of the systems. 
the fusion between the hardware and the software together. Hmm. So by its very nature, AI systems remain engineered systems, systems that are built by engineers of varying degrees to work with engineering constraints. So even the advances of large language models today and all the vast of information they are trained on are still limited by the access to information curated by humans. Since they can't go into some websites because that information is blocked by human capability. Copyright. That's right. All right. Well, actually, one of the uh, things that I really liked during the uh, uh, presentation was uh, treat AI as an opinion, right? That, mm -hmm. that struck me very fresh. But at the same time, here's my question. You know, I totally agree with your, you know, human focused AI thesis. But my question is that uh, your humans need to understand what AI is capable of doing, but also AI needs to understand what humans are capable of doing. I don't think this collaboration would happen without each, you know, both, both parties understand their own advantages and disadvantages. How do you, how do you mitigate that uh, lack of understanding, machines lack of understanding human beings and human beings lack of understanding of machines? Yeah, Junko, that's, that's a really good question. Um, first of all, the machine's lack of understanding of humans comes down to how the machines are being built. Yeah. Okay. It comes back into the development side of those, okay, being pragmatic and saying, okay, the users of this system aren't going to understand the characteristics, all the characteristics of the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of that is in training. Okay. Unfortunately, many of us don't open a user's manual and, and, and most of us are never going to do that. So it means is, okay, how can we use the prompt? I, mean, I, I use chat GTP all the time. How can I use the prompt engineering of chat GTP to encourage me to learn around the capabilities and limitations of what ChatGTP can do. Right. Okay. That's the human centered side of OpenAI's development that, that's kind of not fully formed yet. And, and, I, and I think they'll get to that stuff. On the human side, yeah. we need to be really taught from the get go yeah. that AI is not an answer, it's an opinion. Yeah. And the fact that you know, we should be looking at weighing opinions together. Okay. Let's go to grade school for a moment. Seven, you know, a seven year old can do incredible research with, with a large language chatbots okay, in ways that you would never want a college student doing. Ask Gemini one thing, ask OpenAI another, the same thing. Begin at the fundamental level there to begin to understand the opinions. Mm. At a college level, I want to see a thesis done on intercoder reliability of two different AI driven systems to begin to talk about those differences. Mm. There are doctorate theses that need to be written on this. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, looking to business for a moment, look at capitalizing the capabilities. You know, we, we, we laugh at the, um, case where um in canada um an individual was looking for a bereavement fair and the chatbot gave him the wrong answer and and there's a case written up in, in i think it's uh cnn or the economist around how um, one of the fast food restaurants was using um uh, new ai based techniques to take orders and it, it ordered i think it was 200 dollars or 220 dollars of food or 220 hamburgers in the system um we laugh. I mean, this is the type of mistakes that, that the brittleness of AI occur. But what happens if you begin to take two different AI systems, let them both interpret that, and where they don't match well, bring it back to the human? Okay. Okay. You know, you could probably come up with a much smaller set of edge scenarios in a documenting process or an ordering process. Or perhaps we begin to say, and you know, I was at the, at the coffee shop this morning, hmm, starting to think about is taking the orders from people who speak a lot differently. And we've always had a hard time with, with speech recognition. The problem we should be solving, or at the end of the day, where I want to remove the label is, is the assembly line for different coffee, because you have hot coffee and cold coffee that could literally automatically be dispensed 
in ways humans are touching the system today. They're just pushing buttons. How much sugar? Push one button. How much cream? Push another button. You know, the coffee cup could easily move along the conveyor belt much easily. So where do we want it? What's the problem we want to solve? And is this the right problem for automation? You know, we're not asking those questions. We're, we're, we're trying to deploy what we think is capable. And, and it should, you know, speech systems have been an area we've been struggling with for eons. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, we all speak in our dialects are a little differently and we're getting better. And I can't wait for everything. There, there, there are, um, I think we have some echo. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Excellent. So, so Brian, there, there is this the mentality in some circles that AI should be self-aware. And I can't hear you, Paul. I hear music about that. Oh. All oh, right, Junko. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, maybe. Uh, sorry, uh, listeners. Um, oh, okay. Uh, can you Brian hear us now? Can you hear us now, Brian? He's off stage. Can you bring him back on stage, please? Oh, he's off off stage. I can I can see it. It's off stage. Okay. Yeah. Can uh, you hear us? Can, can you hear us now? I can't hear anything at all. Okay. Let's ask questions on uh, Q and A. I'm going to refresh again. Okay. okay. Can you hear us now? I got rid of it. I found it. Okay. That's automation. Sorry about that. That's automation working in the browser. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's 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 just great. You know. <laughs> Sorry to trigger some cutting requirements, but automation is playing in the background. Here we are, forty to my business to a chat, and and yeah. automation in, in one of my background tabs is is working beautifully. Well, that's 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 part of. Uh, it's interesting that it happened at the same time that you're discussing. And it's sitting and doing nothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so Brian, I was saying that there is a there's an interpretation in some circles of AI as a self-aware um, device or system that that has its own ways of thinking that can come up with its own solutions and things like that. You ask it questions; it's not limited by by the by the structures that you put around it so you know i don't think we're there yet no. we we we'll ever get, get there, there sorry i think we'll get there at some point oh. so Paul, so you can think about this i think a lot of times we need to be thinking about being transparent with the confidences at times we are highly confident with an answer i'm 99% sure this is the right answer hmm. at times we're only 50% confident. Mm -hmm. Humans are really, at the end of the day, much better equipped to take those probabilities and say, you know, I'm willing to stick with the 50% answer today because I need an answer now. But you know what? I have another 24 hours. This isn't good enough. Right. You know, beginning to bring context into the decision equation. Yeah. Yeah, that's the difference, isn't it? I mean, uh, if AI can tell us, oh, I'm only 50% sure with my answer, then actually we can trust AI more, right? Yeah. And, and again, we want to make it so usable and so seamless and so, and, and so trusting that we don't want to bring that into it. Yeah. But again, I'm going to argue that the more we can calibrate trust, yeah. the more we are going to build a system that can evolve more effectively in the future. And again, it's that calibrated trust. It's bringing the human along in the equation. Yeah. I have one last question, actually. Um, with anything automation, I think one of the downside of automation is over-reliance sort of automation. You know, humans are really good at adapting things. Well, it worked before. It's most likely it's going to work again. So, you know, I'm going to forego my training on certain things. I'm just going to, you know, as, as we're saying, you know, editing my stories, you know, put that on chat GPT or put on two different, uh, the LLMs and to see what comes. But it seems like 
that's a, like too much work for me. You know, you just don't want to have one answer. But at the same time, this is the 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 negative side of uh, automation. Supposed to be very convenient, and convenience breeds the uh, laziness out of us. And look, you see this in in autopilot um, yeah. use in Teslas today in the road. Um, and I think you know a lot of the same you know is going to or going to or does occur in AI utilization and other domains as well. I mean, we as humans, you know, begin to trust the automation more and more. Well, we can't avoid that. We need to embrace that and to develop the support features that help us be better as automation is playing a role with us. You know, I use this, this talking point all the time of who would ever forget that automatic transmissions would have made it so much easier to text and drive. Okay, you know, it's in and it's not a problem with automatic transmissions. It's the fact that at the end of the day, as we automate, we are changing the human's requirement and the human needs, quite frankly, moment to moment support. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the real innovations in AI are actually going to come less from the automation and the AI system. It's going to come from how do we support humans use of these tools more effectively, whether that's in assistive driving automated driving or you know the use of ai chatbots yeah how do we support us getting the most out of these tools that are built around us i like the way you kind of that do that are the ones that are actually going to monetize the value of ai the best yeah i like the way you you wrapped it up uh, earlier on you talked about risk and rewards of ai balancing balancing the two and, but it seems to shift more towards the, the user itself. It's kind of like we have to do some self-policing. We have to police ourselves in our usage of AI. But Paula, we have to teach people on how to become self-police. Yeah. We can't expect them to just pick up the technology and, and, and perfectly use it. That doesn't mean we can produce a 60-page or 600-page user manual. Okay, we need to provide some, in, you know, the, the systems need to be intuitive but we also need to, to, to leverage all the aspects of social characteristics and communication and how to be transparent on what the capabilities of this stuff are and how do we teach the populace how to use new tools. You know, smartphones have become part of our life. Social, the social experience right now is being called upon by, um, by um, uh the safety community and um, surgeon generals through different states, if something needs to be policed. Okay. Why? Because we're learning about the barriers of some of this technology and saying that with those barriers, we need to augment humans capabilities and human understanding. I don't think we should be putting a, a, a risk model on, uh, uh, on the screen here of every AI driven system, but I do think we need to change the foundational educational system for the young and the old on what systems are and how technology is supporting us that we never learned in grade school. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brian Raymer. Our time is up. We really appreciate you for this interesting perspective on, on AI as usual. Uh, of course, we've invited you to the Ojuri Shida Report for uh, this kind of illuminating uh, information and we expect to have you back. So we thank you for, your, for, uh, for, for coming on, the, on BOSS 2024. And we want to thank Synaptics for sponsoring this session. Uh, we have a Synaptics booth uh, in the Tech Vision Pavilion. Please visit it. You can access additional videos, white papers, and other assets for downloading. Uh, Dr. Brema, thank you again. Every session has its own unique link. Refer to the summit agenda. And if you've signed up for a specific session, please check your email for the link to the session. We thank you all for joining us and uh, we'll see you in the next session. Chanko and Bola, thanks for having me. It's it was fun. Thanks. Okay. Thank Bye. Bye. Thank you.